Good morning, Revolution, and happy Juneteenth, everybody. It's a great day for protest and struggle and celebration. We've got a guest here, uh, Comrade Alvaro from Texas. Alvaro is the chairman of the party in the great state of Texas and a member of our national board, and he also heads our international commission. Welcome, Alvaro. How are you? Thank you. Good morning, and thank you for inviting me. Oh, we're happy to have you. And uh, Scott, you're sitting in a car. Are you I'm, not I'm driving, a, are you? I'm not driving. Nope. I'm, I'm just sitting. Uh, just sitting. Good. You don't, um, you don't text and drive and you don't <laughs> engage in no, we're, uh, dialogue. Wear a mask. Driving. Don't text and drive. Like We're, we're all needed. Um, uh, and for those of you who, who might not have heard of Juneteenth, um, it's uh, the holiday that commemorates um, the sort of uh, the culmination of, of emancipation. The, the, the last slaves in the United States were, were freed by an order of the general of the General of the Union Army in Texas uh, on June 19th, 1865. So two and a half years after the Emancipation Proclamation. Actually, they were already free. We just didn't no, know they, it. That's they had, exactly uh, right. Correct. Correct. There had been a uh, uprising of the slaves, uh, including a general strike, and uh, many uh, joined the Union Army and uh, fought tooth and nail alongside the Union forces for our own liberation. And uh, so all of that is uh, celebrated uh, uh, today on uh, Juneteenth. Uh, and we're also celebrating Reconstruction right, the Reconstruction period, which followed the Civil War, which was a really revolutionary period, you know, it uh, moved towards advanced democracy, there was a redistribution, redistribution, a little bit, not, no, no 40 acres and a mule, we never got that, but there was a little bit of redistribution of the land, but most importantly, African Americans were elected to state government, and uh, uh, another big thing that happened in uh, Reconstruction was the public school was yep. introduced into these United States as a result of the radical reforms of uh, of Reconstruction. Uh, and, and and Joe, we're we're, we're starting to experience now a uh, another Reconstruction post COVID nineteen Reconstruction. And I think that's what we're seeing uh, today with the uprising in this country and abroad. Well, there, that would be the third reconstruction. There was a second yes. reconstruction also, they argue, mm -hmm. during the uh, coming about as a result of the civil rights period, mm -hmm. right? All of and these the passage you can of, think of in the, in the terms of, of democratic revolution, right? The, the attempt to, to um, either fulfill the, the promises of capitalist democracy to establish a democracy based on equal political rights and, and universal suffrage. Um, this, this process that's been ongoing and, and has these, these upsurges and, and intensifications, um, reconstruction and, and the civil rights movement and um, uh, the New Deal in, in some sense. Uh, um, and now I think you know, we're in another of those intensification periods or those, you know, upticks of this, this democratic struggle. Um, well, one of the things that happened in the uh, 60s was the passage of a number of laws that outlawed discrimination. There was the Voting Rights Act, there was the Fair Housing Act, and so on and so forth. And there was a creation of uh, Medicaid and, and, and so on. Um, and a number of, there was the great society that uh, your, your congressman, uh, Alvaro from uh, Texas, Lyndon Johnson. Absolutely. Uh, put forward. Um, and, uh, but then in the 70s and 80s, there was a big counter revolution from the right, mm -hmm. you know, under Reagan and Bush and neoliberalism was invented. You That's know? right. That, that was a reaction to the falling rate of profit in the 60s. But what also the background for the uh, movement, the civil rights movement, certainly in the 60s, was the war in Vietnam. And mm. that had major repercussions. Uh, and the symbolic resistance that came about on a mass scale at that time was to see 
the caskets coming back, the dead bodies coming back from U.S. soldiers in Vietnam. That created a lot of uh, a lot of unrest in that country. So that spurred an international, uh, uh, certainly among the youth and others, an uh, uprising. Uh, started in this country, then it went on to in, into Europe, in France, and other countries. So, and we're seeing uh, something like that now as well, right? An, an international kind of um, development and uh, of this this I uprising. Think our, 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 our Marxist science tells us that that change comes about when you have a major contradiction. Now, we sometimes focus purely on one contradiction at a time, but there's multiple contradictions going on in the world at the same time. So we were talking about the civil rights movement. That was one contradiction, right? The oppression and super exploitation of African-Americans and, and people of color, women and so forth. But what was also happening at that time was the, was the oppression in, uh, against people of color in Vietnam at the same time. It, um, so sometimes one crisis uh, stimulates and catalyzes another crisis. So the same thing we're feeling today is, is that one crisis, the, the post-COVID crisis, is making people more reflective of their conditions and their, their contradictions. And so that has found, the catalyst today certainly has been post COVID and also post uh, uh, police brutality, but it's, it's much broader than that. And we see people demonstrating all over the world, uh, Alvaro, huge demonstrations uh, in Africa and Asia and Latin America and Europe, you know, in solidarity yeah. with the struggles that are taking place here. It, and you, our you're fraternal parties right. are involved, no? Yes, I mean, we're, we're uh, the Communist Party is part of the international uh, movement of communist and workers' parties. And initially, we were getting messages of solidarity with the uprising in the United States around the police brutality case of uh, George Floyd, which, by the case, also grew up and, uh, and was buried here in Texas, in, in, uh, in Houston, Houston, Texas, right? near to, mm. in Houston. That's correct. So I, I went to the procession. I participated in the procession for George Floyd. But we were getting a lot of messages of solidarity from uh, communists and workers' parties. But then we start seeing a lot of spontaneous demonstrations all over Europe, uh, all over in, in, in Canada, in, in Mexico, in uh, New Zealand, and in, in, uh, also in, uh, in uh, Australia. Uh, then we start getting uh, uh, more and more messages of solidarity from Latin America and from Syria, from countries that you would not expect they would a lot of young people sending messages. I even received a message from a young man who says, I have certain skills and I want to I want to help from Greece. <laughs> Wonderful. So so I mean people all over the world saying we, we want to be a part of this resistance. And, um, and, this, and this, is, this is this is a wonderful thing, this internationalization of the fight against racism. It's uh yes. what's the cause of it, uh, Scott? Is it the internet? Is it the interpenetrations of imperialism? Is it the COVID-19 uh, and the breakup of the supply chains around the world and the resulting economic crisis? What, what the hell's going on? Um, all, all of the above. I mean, the, <laughs> the working class is international. Um, capitalism, uh, although it, you know, it varies in its um, forms and methods and intensity from place to place is is international um, uh, white supremacy with capitalism uh, spread itself around the globe, and and this is a. I mean, it's it sort of it seems not beautiful, but but very natural that it should be happening. And way. the Trump administration is exporting white supremacy, aren't they? I mean, Steve yeah. Bannon and them guys. It's, There's certainly the stroke in the it, fires. Uh, the the. Yeah, the, the, right now the the Trump administration certainly is is uh, playing on racism in in promoting racism in order to win the elections in November. So it, that language is resonating also all over the world, and they realize that while they had expectations for a better world coming out of the COVID nineteen pandemic, that uh, the Trump administration certainly has taken none of these lessons. And is still promoting racism and uh, 
and anti-democratic measures, uh, anti-immigrant measures, and so forth. It, uh, but one of the gratifying things, I think, this international solidarity is, is how people are tying it, how they tie the message of anti-racism to the anti-capitalist, because they see the ties between racism as a form of exploitation, super exploitation, and exploitation as a component part of, of capitalism. Uh, they talk about, for instance, the, uh, there was a, a, a large demonstration in front of the U.S. Embassy in Greece, where young people, yeah, there, young people put up a, a sign mm -hmm. says capitalism means that we cannot breathe. So they're taking mm -hmm. this uh, statement from this country, from George Floyd, that we cannot breathe, to say that capitalism does, is not allowing young people in the working class to breathe, uh, that the knee of imperialism is on the neck of everybody around the world of US imperialism. So, um, and now that people are talking about not only this uh, inequality before the criminal justice system, they're also talking about the color of wealth. It's primarily white. And uh, so there's wealth inequality. I think people are also seeing, beginning to see in a mass way um, what, you know, what is meant by structural violence and structural racism, um, rather than seeing, you know, racism as, as this compartmentalized thing that is, um, you know, a mental problem with, with people who think white people are superior to black people. They're beginning to see that the ways in which it's built into society and operates constantly creates this kind of constant pressure. Um, another thing that's been interesting is watching the, the, this movement, this ups, upsurge or this uprising is really in response to the, to the extreme right um, and its, um, its presence in the police, but it's also forcing, um, it, it's either forcing or giving room to a lot of um, uh, moderates or liberals or whatever to, to take new positions. Um, I saw an article in the New York Times um, that addressed the, the struggle of the Palestinian people through the lens of uh, George Floyd, which, you know, in the in the communist um, movement has been certainly, you know, known for a long time. The connection between um, white supremacy here and, and settler colonialism in in Palestine, but the, that was the first time I'd seen it on, you know, on the, the front page of a major paper. Well, let's talk about this a little bit. You know, the, 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 after the First World War, soldiers returned, black soldiers re returned. And there was massive dissatisfaction and there were uprising and there were, there were race riots uh, in a number of different places, Oklahoma, for example, on the Black Wall Street. Uh, and then uh, after World War II, same kind of thing uh, developed. We were going to Germany and Italy and Spain fighting uh, and uh, but we faced racism and Jim Crow at home, and 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 some of the movements put up the uh, slogan of Double V for Victory. We fight racism on two fronts: mm -hmm. against fascism and against Jim Crow at home. But the problem still persisted. And then we had this other uprising in the '60s, you know, uh, and uh, with the Freedom Rides and and uh, Edmund Pettus Bridge and, and uh, 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 the March on Washington and so on, Selma and so on and so forth, Birmingham. And still the, the problems of racism persisted all through uh, today. And one of the things that, that, that happened in the 60s is that the struggle for civil rights was separated from the struggle for economic rights that was put forward by the Civil Rights Congress and William Patterson and Paul Robeson and W.E.B. Du Bois and Claudia Jones and all of them. Uh, the Cold War, in other words, is what I'm saying, interfered with the civil rights uh, struggle, you know? And so at the end of Henry Winston's book, he has a chapter, Strategy for a Black Agenda, he talks about going from anti-slavery to anti-monopoly strategy. In other words, is the problem, Alvaro, that now we have to link the struggle for civil rights with the struggle for economic and social rights? Or is that too leading of a question? 
I think that uh, <laughs> for, for a very long time, the, uh, the discussion around racism was confined within a framework, a narrative, that racism is just purely a prejudiced thing. It's a re mm -hmm. rhetoric thing. We don't use our names to refer to other people, but purely on a very superficial level. There was every effort to make sure that the discussion did, no, did not go beyond that to the fundamentals, the root cause of racism, which is a system of oppression. It's a made up thing to, to be able to justify, it used to be at one time justify racism, but also to keep working people separate from each other, uh, disunited because they're the vast majority of the population. It, uh, so the vast majority of the population is, is kept you this united through the through racism and other forms of discrimination it uh, so I think that when uh, Martin Luther King for instance started making the tie between the uh, uh, racism in this country and then lack of e uh, economic equality he said what good is it to have the right to go into a particular uh, uh, cafe or restaurant if you don't have the money to buy what you want to buy there. Yeah. And so he made the tie. He also made that very important tie between pub, uh, public service, the amount of money that was available to the population versus the military budget in, in the war uh, in imperialism. So basically between the tie between racism, uh, social inequality in this country and imperialism. So Coincidentally, once he joined the, the labor movement in solidarity with the labor movement in this country, you know, he was assassinated. They killed so, him. They killed absolutely him. Absolutely killed and, him. And, and, and so I, I want to make this point uh, real quick because you talked about the connection between the struggles uh, for civil rights and other forms of discrimination. And this week, and we, we would be really amiss not to mention this, uh, you had the Supreme Court's decision on DACA. Absolutely. Right, Alvaro? And, and, That's and also correct. on discrimination against LGBTQ people in the workplace. That wasn't and that also on, was it? Huh? And also on um, uh, preventing ICE from sort of conscripting local law enforcement. So the, the, the new Fugitive Slave Act, is, as some have called it, has been eliminated. ICE is not allowed to... Um, in this local and, and I think that this yeah, this event, certainly with this uh, this Supreme Court decision on DACA, and all the discussions been going on with respect to the elect Trump's uh, re-election campaign, uh, and and even before that, when he focused uh, during 2016 and afterwards, and even today, on uh, anti-immigrant uh, discrimination by calling Mexicans uh, uh, rapist in uh, Mexico sending us the worst people. And so forth, and, and uh, so this was all effort to dehumanize. Same thing with racism. Uh, its purpose is to dehumanize people so they can be treated in a super exploitive manner. And so that mm. applies to all people of color. It also applies to uh, even other, you know, the the gender issue and so forth. So the other decision was on the again uh, on uh, on the uh, the extension of the civil rights case to LGBT people. It, uh, that they were also uh, protected from discrimination on the job. So I think that I don't, I don't think that these are isolated Supreme Court cases. They actually came on the, on the, on, uh, after the, uh, this uprising in this country when millions of people are in action. <clears throat> so they, this was a response to some of that, even from a very, conservative Very, very important. Very, very important, hugely important. And so the, uh, the big issue that we're going to have to address going forward is what are the structural changes that need to happen with respect to the economy, with respect to the criminal justice system, with respect to the political system, with respect to everything in this country, you know, and uh, measures like affirmative action are going to have to be uh, they got kind of hidden away put under the table are going to have to be brought back front and center. And one of the big and issues is- Enfolded together. Enfolded together. And, and one of the big issues is how to integrate them and address them 
with respect to the economic underbasis of all of these problems. Because at the end of the day, capitalism cannot solve this crisis. It can't. We need public measures. Government has to be involved, which means not the bureaucracy, but that the people have to be involved in settling it in a public way. Well, I think our time is just about up. So Alvaro, thank you so much for joining us this morning and sharing the international and domestic perspectives on this uh, uh, very important issue. And Scott, we definitely live it. We definitely live in the new, in, in the new, in the new, in a new world. In its uh, new world, uh, a new normal. This is new the new normal. normal. Scott, you know what the communists used to say: that a revolutionary situation has two conditions. On the one hand, the ruling class cannot rule in the old way. The old way. Right. And on the other hand, the people refuse to be ruled. Yep. In the, old in the old way. One condition has been is being met. Our people are saying no to the old normal. We want a new normal. And now the uh, the issue is how to broaden that, how to how to deepen it, how to defeat Trump in the process of it, uh, and then create a situation in which uh, we can build a new society. Well, thank everybody. Thank you. Have a great weekend. Happy Juneteenth. Uh, good afternoon, Revolution. And uh, <laughs> we'll see you. We'll see you next week. Take care now. Bye bye. Bye bye. Yep.